Uh, Lord willing, this will be the first in a series of five messages uh, concerning the abundance of salvation. I've been wanting to do this ever since I had uh, spoken of uh, um, uh, of uh, um, having your uh, your soul delight itself in fatness. But as I looked at it, it just got larger and larger and larger, and I wanted to be precise about it. And uh, when Brother Given had his, his class on abundance, it gave me an opportunity to be able to kind of whittle it down to where I would to be able to be precise in it. So the, this, uh, this first uh, um, sermon is kind of just going to be an overview, o- overview of the abundance. that um, They might have life and might have it more abundantly, just kind of as a summary. Uh, First of all, I wanted to say something about this having life. Because it really struck me whenever I read this. that In the flesh, it can't really be said that anyone has life in the sense that he uses it in this text. Our mortal life isn't really something that we possess. It's not of a possession of our own. It can really only be said that we're alive because it's been granted to us for a space of time that God has determined to sustain our mortal life. Uh, ask anyone this question on their deathbed and surely I'm, they'll confess to you that uh, I can't keep my life. This isn't something that I can grasp and hold on to. It's, mortal life is a fleeting thing. However, we do possess in a very real sense the life which we have been given in Christ Jesus. This life can be kept. This life can be held on to. It is actually ours for a possession. Uh, We've been made to be partakers of the divine nature. Uh, We've been given a new heart and we've been given a new mind. We've been given a a new man that's been created in righteousness and and true holiness. That's been created after the image of of him that created it. And and all of these things, they're compatible with the world to come. And and because of that, we're not going to have to give them up at at the conclusion of this world. Rather, we're actually going to receive the things of which these things are first fruits. So in this sense, we actually do have eternal life now in the measure that we're able to experience it in this present time. Uh, To use the definition that the Savior uh, gave in the 17th chapter of John, if eternal life is to to know God and Jesus Christ whom He hath sent, in the present time we have been given to know God. We have been given to know somewhat of the uh, um, uh, nature of God and His salvation. We have been illuminated and been given to know uh, part of the nature of God. But we do admit... Uh, along with the words of the hymn writer, that the half cannot be fancied. Uh, ha- it cannot be fancied this side the golden shore. That we, we we do see as but a through a glass darkly in the present time. That we we have really only touched the hem of the garment with, with what we have seen so far. The bulk of what is able to be known cannot be perceived of those who who behold him through the veil of time and and of flesh. Uh, the, the experience of life more abundantly, as, as he speaks of it in this text, is yet to come. Uh, so this evening, I want to kind of take a summary of these things, which we'll be considering in the coming messages, Lord willing, and, and trace out the nature of this uh, redemption as one from being beginning to end is characterized by abundance. We'll see that this is not in any sense meager in its nature. So, uh, uh, as it concerns the series at hands, using the text as a summary, firstly, what, what is involved in, in those who were dead in trespasses and sins becoming alive unto God? Uh, this, is a, this is a weighty consider, consideration, that those who once dwell in the valley of the shadow of death, that those people have actually become light in the Lord, that we might have life. Now the first stage of abundance that we see in his salvation is simply this, that we have actually been delivered from depravity. That, uh, to, to be able to impart this life unto us, that the, the issue of sin had to be dealt with. The, the debt had to be paid. Uh, sin was, was, as, it was an issue before God. This had to be taken out of the way. Before there could be any upward movement, so to speak, in the building of the church, before you, you could have any uh, forward movement with, in, in the purpose of God, this, this had, to be, had to be dealt with. 
And, and, and I'm declaring to you tonight that this, this was done. In, in, in the death of Christ, He did pay that sin debt. He did take care of that. That the groundwork was laid in the cross. And, and we see that even in the groundwork, that this was an abundant thing. Uh, it says in Ephesians 1, 7, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace." Now, there's a richness that's involved in this. "...wherein He hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence." See, you, you don't ever hear of the death of Christ and the, and the works that were wrought as a result of it, spoken of in the Scripture in a meager manner. You, you don't hear about it, it just barely met the requirements. Uh, this is where the, the people who, who, who speak about the limited atonement and all these kind of things, they make a mistake. Because not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, it, Jesus paid it all. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Uh, concerning the potency of it, that, that actually through death, he, he was able to destroy him who had the power of death. That at his weakest moment, his weakest moment as a human, he was able to defeat the person who had held the human race under slavery for the entirety, for the entire history of the world. And that weakest moment, he was able to destroy him. That, that was an abundant, an abundant death. That actually sounds like an oxymoron. There was no other death in the whole history of the humanity that did anything. This is an abundant death. Amen. For by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. See, what we hear about all the time in the, in the Old Covenant, how they had to offer it over and over and over and over again for sins. But no, not, not Jesus. One time He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And Isaiah, he was able to... Um, to, to sense this, that this was this is what the Lord wanted to do in this purpose. That this is uh, this is the direction in, in which the purpose of God was going. When when He said this, He said, "Seek the Lord while He may be found, and call ye upon Him while He is near. And let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and He will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon." An abundant pardon, this is, this is what we have in Christ Jesus. And, and this is the reason why. Because it not only forgave us our sin in the sight of God, but it, it actually cleansed our conscience so that we knew that we were forgiven. It, it was a thorough, a thorough pardon. It says in the text in Ephesians that, we, uh, that I just um, talked about, "...having made known unto us the mystery of His will." Let's say he, he, he made this known unto us. Uh, we, we were not left ignorant of us. "...having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus." So we, we have this boldness, we have this confidence because we know what the blood of Jesus did having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, having a clean conscience. And see, even a pardon in the world that doesn't just remove the guilt of somebody and leave them in prison, the person who has the pardon, they know about it because they're not in prison anymore. And they realize they've been forgiven their charge because they're no longer kept under the bondage that, that their, their charge kept them under. Well, and incidentally, also, I was thinking about this, that the, um, somebody who receives a pardon in the world, they're not in prison anymore, I don't think that they get the idea that that pardon is a license for them to go out and do whatever got them into prison in the first place. <laughs> Those who've been forgiven, they've, they've also been sanctified and they've been set apart. By the riches of His grace, those who have been abundantly pardoned, they have not just been forgiven and left to their own devices. Uh, they, they, those who were former aliens or criminals, that they were uh, forgiven of their offenses, but they were also to, uh, um, healed of their desire to commit further ones. These, this was taken away. The, their, their stony heart was taken out and a heart of flesh was, was put in. Uh, the cleansing was so abundant that not only are we cleansed from all unrighteousness, but we're actually continually kept from it as, as well. well. We're not just taken from evil, we are taken to righteousness. See, we've not just been forgiven our debt, we've been taken into a place of riches. 
of, of abundance. And Ezekiel prophesied of this, that this is going to take place. We, we, we quote this text a lot, but it's, it's a good text. I'm going to say it again. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And, and I will take the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. And I cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. See, the new birth is not a metaphor. It isn't. It's something actually happened. God said, I'm going to do this. And He did it in Christ Jesus. He did it. See, we actually want what the Lord wants now. We're willing in the day of His power. See, I am come that they might have life. That's what's involved in this. That, that uh, they might actually be one. That, Je- that we are actually becoming one with Christ. Jesus said this as, as well in the 17th chapter of John. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. That they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. That's, an, that's glorious. It's an abundant thing, brethren. Now, as we've been rehearsing these things so far, I was thinking about this. What what of a person who's come to a place where where they become burned out, or they they become bored following Christ? Well, what's happened? Oh, they've forgotten about all of these things that have have, that have that have happened to bring them into the kingdom. They've forgotten about all of the abundance that God has shed forth, so that they would have, have be able to take part in this. That they have neglected to to maintain the direction that they have been set in Christ Jesus. When you you, uh, keep walking on that narrow way, it it opens up into a very, very large room. And this this brings us to the life more, more abundantly. Uh, see, we've been pardoned, we've been changed, we've been born again, not a corruptible seed, and we've been sanctified and set apart, and we've been made meet for a reason, though, and that is to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. See, we've not been saved for this world, we've been saved for a very high calling. We've been saved to, to take part in this more abundant and more grand and exceeding purpose that He has he's revealed to us. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, He hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. See, there, there is a purpose that we have been brought unto. See, there is, there's a hope that's laid up before us. Amen. These great and precious promises, these things that God has, has promised to those who overcome, this is what our walk is characterized by now. We, we, have, we have an abundance of first fruits now that, that they actually allow us to, uh, um, to, to seek Him without being drawn away to other things. These first fruits that we have, that they've, they've cult- given us to culture and appetite for the things to come now. And, and no, nothing else seems worthy now. We, we're not drawn away to lesser things because we have the very substance of things to come. See, we've been joined to Christ, not just figuratively, but in experience we've been joined to Christ. We were able to testify of this. That as faith works within us, we've actually been able to fellowship with Him and being workers together with Him in our salvation. That that we're we're being cultured in the manner of the the kingdom. That we're, we're we're being brought into the work. We're being, actually being prepared for the place that we're going to have in the, in the work that is to come. We, we talked about this this week, that uh, the, the world to come is going to be a, a place of prodigious work. And that's, that's what we're being prepared for. As Christ sits as, as head over all things to the church, and He's orchestrating things according to the will of God, we are, uh, we're being prepared for, the, for our place. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. See, this is what we're doing. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so in an abundant entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. See, we've, we've been delivered from our sins abundantly. This has happened. We've been given an abundant hope. 
We've been given richly all of the blessings that we need in the present time to lead us to our heavenly home. We've been given all everything that pertains unto life and godliness. And as, as such, it shouldn't be a surprise that at the conclusion of our journey, we aren't just going to barely make it into glory. Now we're talking about an abundant entrance. I said we talked about this recently in one of our men's meetings. That uh, It was excellent about how we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. That having an abundant entrance means that we haven't overcome just enough to make it through the world without being drawn back into perdition. See, we've overcome abundantly. See, we've not only escaped the wrath that is to come, we're actually, we've actually obtained a good report. See, we have, we've actually glorified God by our lives. We, we've actually been made partakers of, of Christ to, to the degree that we're not merely just not going to be condemned, we're going to be glorified together with Him. And this is, these are just a few things that are promised to, to him that overcometh. I wanted to read a few of these because this, this is just characterized by abundance. You could, uh, this tone of it. The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. But that's not it. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. So writing upon writing upon writing. Yeah. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So, so looking forward to this entrance in the present, uh, this is actually the posture in which we live our lives. We are, we're primarily obtaining rather than abstaining. Uh, it's true, there are things that we have to abstain from in the present life. But this isn't the focus of our lives. See, we're not focused upon the opposition against us. We are focused on the goal from which the opposition is trying to prevent us. See, we talked about this last week. Uh, again, that this is going to be a prodigious work. And with this in mind, in the present, we're not just warring to overcome our opposition or just to prevent from drawing back. The vexation of our temptation and the attack from the wicked one isn't just that it's inconvenient or that it's unpleasant, but it, it's that it prevents us from doing as much as we would like to do to be able to serve God in the present. That's really the, the, the reason why we want to be freed from it. It's because we can't, we can't do what we would do. Paul said it this way, we're not hoping to end that we, that we would be unclothed, but that we would be clothed upon. See, we're not just seeking the end of the opposition for the sake of comfort, that, that, that we might be unhindered in our service to God. It's, it's good to culture yourself to think this way because there's not always going to be opposition. Uh, there's going to be a day when we will war no longer. Uh, there's going to be a day when our faith shall become sight. And when there's gonna, not going to be any more need to put off. And the only thing that's going to be left are the, are the treasures that you have laid up for yourselves in heaven and the things that you have been diligent to put on in the present time. So then, it, this brings us to the final portion of our consideration, which is, it's the time in which the true abundance shall be made manifest in its fullness. And this is, this is really the realization of our hope. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. See, the end that is inside, it's more glorious than any of us can even dare imagine in the present. Our, our, our desires aren't even able to reach that high. We can't even begin to think that high in our current state. But this is actually good news, if you think about it. You know, in the world, this might prevent somebody from being involved with something if they knew that they couldn't ever know everything about it. But for us, this is actually a comfort because we know that on that day, we're not going to be dissatisfied with what we find in Him because we know that He is going to be, it's going to be better than what we imagined it was going to be. And in the present time, there's no end to what we can have. There's no end to what we can seek for. 
for. There's no end to the goodness of the Lord that we can have in the present time. <laughs> Against such things, brethren, there is no law. Let, let him take, who else, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. It's open. That the quest for heaven will never yield unsatisfying results because there is no end to the goodness of God. Amen. Uh, that being said, it's, it's good to culture your mind to reach as high as you can. Yeah. You know, get as much as you possibly can. Uh, increase your appetite as much as you possibly can because your comprehension of the glory that awaits, well, it'll actually affect the way that you press towards it. If you have a small view of heaven and a small view of, of the world to come, then it, that, that'll, uh, you won't be able to count that, uh, everything but loss to be able to obtain it. And this is actually being worked out according to the power that works in us. I thought that the, that was an incredible thing. That this, this incredible power that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Uh, Brother Given said superlative upon superlative upon superlative. You can't even think this high. That power is working in you. That, that's a comfort. How can, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now the last verse of this text, it's a premier example of, of what it means to have life more abundantly. Uh, to be forever a partaker of the glory of God. To not, to not only be glorifying to Him, um, but to be um, glorified together with Him. Yeah, as, as Jesus spoke in John 17, to be one as Christ and God are one. It's, it's, this is like the, the culmination of divine intent and salvation, that He might glorify Himself through the church. And throughout all ages, that is, you know, in, the, in the present, in every age, and in, in times past, and uh, if the Lord tarries in the future, and in every age in which the individual generations out of which the church was called, God reserves unto Himself the glory for calling them out and leading them to glory by Christ Jesus. And, and, and in the present time, the keeping of the saints uh, it glorifies God. And he, he shows His superiority over all of those who would attempt to frustrate His purpose by Him keeping them and by Him... him uh, leading many sons to glory. But that being said, this, this isn't the paramount exhibition of the glory of God in salvation. World without end. Yeah. That is. Yeah. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. And uh, he, this is talking about the church. He says, Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. I wanted to... Um, it, this is really edifying to me and uh, to to go through this just and this is just the dic the dic uh, the dictionary definition of spot and of wrinkle but it was really edifying to read it uh, the, this the, you think about this this is what the church is not going to have a spot the first thing is a, a stain made by a foreign matter <laughs> Not going to have any of that. Uh, something that mars one's character or reputation. You're not going to have no character flaws. Or a, a mark caused by disease, allergic reaction, or decay. Uh, that's all that's going to be taken away. And a wrinkle is a small furrow or a crease in the skin as from aging or frowning. Uh, that's all. Not going to be aging or frowning there. Uh, or a temporary ridge on a surface due to contraction, folding, or crushing. See, all of the trying has already going to been done. Yeah, it, it was. It was just a temporary. We're going to be able to say, yeah, the the, the sufferings of the present time. Those were just a, a temporary slight ridge. So this a world without end, this, this is a, a small phrase, it envelops a concept which is in its magnitude. It's, it's too large for the human constitution and its present form to comprehend. This is massive. This is the, the true definition of abundance. 
Having lived our entirety of our existence within a realm where everything eventually has an end, and it's, it's a rare thing to even find something that stays the same for an extended period of time. The idea of a, of a world that has no end, this, this stretches the mind. But this is our future, brethren. This is the future of those who are in Christ. World without end. And we're not just talking about the duration of it. This is talking about the goodness of it combined with the duration of it, and that's, that's a blessed thought. So in closing, brethren, let's, let's not lose sight of these things, of, of this aspect of salvation. This is, this is too good. Let's not ever be of the number who would be complacent in our running of the race. We, we would consider the magnitude of the things that we have been brought to in Christ Jesus. This will never cease to stimulate your spirit when you think about these things. It, it, it'll make you thankful for the things which you've been given already. And it, when, you, when you stop and examine these things, you'll be able to, to count everything that you have now but lost to, to be able to obtain those things that lie ahead. Thank you, brethren.